Welcome back to class, everybody. It's a bloody sandy day in the neighborhood. And we are moving on to swords. Now, I've got a few gaps in my uh, my helping wall over there. I'm still kind of getting things set up, but I figured, why not go ahead and kick this pig, get things started a little bit early, all right? Going to just go ahead and hang this guy up right there. And then I've got time for one more... Uh, there you are. Boop. And we're good to go. Alright, so today's topic of interest is swords. One of my swords has already despawned, so we better get this uh, get this ball rolling. I'll just spawn it back in when I'm done, because I'm going to be starting this and going to that end. Um, then I'm going to hit my weapon wall, then I'm going to hit what I got on me, just like I did with my first three episodes. So... Starting on the far side, uh, the most common sword you'll ever hear about in the European era, the standard arming sword. A side... Whoa, what happened to my tracking? Holy crap. So this weapon, let me just fix my mug here. Holy shit. Um, so this... So this is a standard sidearm of soldiers everywhere towards the end of the uh, the Dark Ages. Most of them were wielding some sort of arming sword. It, it had a beautiful taper going all the way to the top. As you can see, it's not janky. It's not a sharp taper. It's nice, even lines, almost straight, not quite, which again, you don't want straight lines. You want almost straight. Um, it allowed it to have great stabbing potential to try and get through chain mail, but allowed for amazing chop. Now, this one has a fuller running all the way to the tip. Uh, that's not typically how the sword's fuller would go. It would end usually right about here, but uh, I'll allow it. That, that beautiful fuller there allowed the sword to be lighter without being weaker. And the reason it would stop a little bit short of the tip is because you don't want your tip to have a gap in it to be able to wobble because then you're going to clip your tip. But again, because it was just a basic sidearm of soldiers everywhere, I don't think they really cared too much. It was probably a dime a dozen kind of a steel sword. Next up, we got the Scottish Broadsword, also known as the Basket-Hilted Sword, as you can tell by the absolute fucking basket there that you put your hand in. Um, again, short fuller with a long top blade, allowing for great stabbing, clashing potential without any weakening of the blade. Um, this thing was used after the Scotland's Age of Refinement, where they gave up their claymores, they gave up their, their hand and a half, their, oh, that was probably really loud in the mic. They gave up their hand and a half, they gave up their, their brutal weapons, their, their nasty weapons of war, into being more of a dueling, kind of more refined era. This was right before the, the age of the, the Scottish mercenaries with their pike and shot formations. This kind of big guard here was meant to protect your hand from really any kind of collision. That way you, you wouldn't lose your hand in a duel or a fight. Probably not going to be worn onto the field of battle because, again, there's a really big guard. It'd be kind of hard to have sit on your hip. But uh, a nasty blade nonetheless because that long top blade with a great stab and slash is going to be an absolute chop stab potential. Um, not really my weapon of choice, but I definitely want one. I am not going to lie to you. I want one. Oh, my nose is really itchy. Give me a minute. Oh, holy crap. Hmm. Oh, why is my nose so itchy? All right. Moving on. We've got a returning fan favorite, the Kopesh. All about that chop. Uh, no trouble. Got that, got that little... The little back hook here to rip somebody down off their horse or to hook around a shield to come back with that chop. Um, all the weight would be right here, a good fusion between a battle axe and a sword right here. This little hook here for catching around on the meat. Um, this next one is used by poor soldiers for poor soldiers, the soldier's cleaver. Uh, these were oftentimes issued before those guys became commonplace. As you can see, it's all one solid bit of metal curved around the handle for a real cheap guard. But this thing would just shunk right into you like your waistband. As you can see, rough battered steel going throughout with a bulb here at the tip. 
So that's where the most of your chopping power is going to be is on that little bulb, but the whole blade is definitely a, a good chopping potential. A bit of a spike here, so you can stab, but I wouldn't stab an armored opponent. This would be used against unarmored or lightly armored, like leather. Um, but definitely a good hacking weapon with a decent handguard for punching or for, for in case a sword glances off your hand. Oh, holy crap, my nose is itchy. Oh my god. Ah. Uh. So blocking hacking potential definitely there. You got to watch out though because the sword could slide right down your blade right into your hand because that hand grip is not complete. So now you can see why it was a poor soldier's weapon. Probably hammered out 30 of these a day by any ordinary blacksmith. Moving on to the weapon wall. You were in our last episode for a little surprise spotlight, the Cat's Balder. Used by the Landsnitch, a very famous uh, German mercenaries who used the Zweihandler, which I'll cover in tomorrow's episode. These guys were a wonderful weapon of war with the most emphasis on chopping, but their fuller did stop short to give themselves some stabbing potential. But that really thick taper there, not a stabbing weapon. Uh, moving on to another weapon with a pretty thick taper. Let me just get on down here. This is the Ulfbert Sword, a Viking special. As you can see by the fist pommel there, a classic Viking kind of pommel. Uh, Germanic pommel as well. Um, this sword, again, taper stops just short of the tip to allow the tip some definite stabbing potential. Uh, definitely a chopping, slashing weapon with some stabbing, but uh, as with the Cat's Balder, probably not an emphasis on stabbing. Moving on. Oh, I forget your name every time. Uh, da, 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 da. The Yadagan. This one I've actually used on stream before. It slices beautifully. Oh my god, is that a beautiful slicer. With a little bit of a stabbing potential, surprisingly. Um, that is because the blade, as you can see, the tip does realign itself with the blade. I would never use it to stab IRL, but in this game it does seem to stab really well. But because of the gentle slope here... It has great draw slashes. I've taken limbs and heads off with this thing, and I didn't think it'd be able to. I didn't think it'd have the weight for it. But that gentle belly lends itself really well to a pulling slash. And it is a it is a certifiable nasty bit of work. Uh, next, we've got the Xiphus of Greece. A leaf blade design. As you can see, it comes in and back out. Um, that allowed it to do something similar to this, but not quite to the same capacity. It was definitely had some good slicing potential, but because it's double bladed with the tip perfectly aligned with the handle, this had some serious stab potential. For anyone wondering, that is how you spell Xiphus. Um, it was used by hoplites when their spears were no longer usable, or if if the the spear wall was broken, say you know your shield wall, your your phalanx as they called it, was cracked. Um, they'd whip these bad boys out, and they'd get the stab and slash in there. So they'd be able to thrust them into the gaps in the other phalanx's uh, shield wall, because uh, the phalanx shield is round, and while it does overlap with your buddy, there's still gaps between yours and the guy above you that they could try to get the sword in and, you know, get somebody in there. Um, its design was... Uh, how do I do air quotes here? Um, improved by the Romans who built the Gladius. Uh, there's that name for you. The, the Gladius, again, gentle kind of taper here with a thick diamond tip. Look at that hard diamond there top, where it just, it just chunks and then goes straight down. Um, surprisingly a decent stabbing weapon because of, because of its, its thickness on the side and because this tip was pounded out specifically for stabbing. Um, it doesn't have the same belly taper as the Xiphus, a lot more hard edge lines, but because the rest of the blade is technically thinner than this top right here, uh, right here, once you get to here, the rest of the sword will just slide in and out of the armor. Um, this was used by the Roman legionnaires and Hastati to insane effect in expanding the Roman Empire. Uh, next, we've got one of my favorite words to ever pronounce. The Ikakalaka, which was an African executioning sword meant for beheadings because you'd catch their neck in that bell and just chomp right off, man. Uh, the tip, not really good stabbing tip, very wide. Now, if I got a, you know, that, that double-handed down thrust, 
that would inf that that could probably take off a limb pretty decently, but I wouldn't trust it to do it every time. Um, definitely more of a slicing slashing sword. Several fullers running down the blade all the way to the tip there. Probably more stylistic, especially with like the gem. This was never a weapon of war. It was definitely ceremonial. But on the battlefield, I would hate to go up against one of these. Hate it. Now, the last two, I apologize, they are technically hand and a half, not the one-handed that we've been looking at up until now. But, because tomorrow's great swords, I figured I'd, I'd dip my little... Oh, you, my foot doesn't actually move. I was hoping to do, like, a little thing. I was hoping to dip my toes into the the proverbial uh, pool. And, because these swords are both light enough, because they're hand and a half that you can wield them easily with one hand. But when you mix that second hand in there, they become real good chopping weapons. Whoa, Jesus. They become real good chopping weapons. See, whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. Other hand, chop. So, wow, that is a thick blade. Anywho, we're going to start with this guy. We're going to go to that guy. This is the Clooney hand and a half sword. I don't know why they call it that. Um, honestly, I'd, I'd like to figure that out. Now, as you can tell by the other hand and a half here, this blade's a lot thinner and is built in with this little rain guard here at the top. Um, what I like about this sword is that it's kind of thick. Now, most hand and halves, you think, well, Jake, you don't want a thick sword that can't slice. Um, whoa. Oh, well, there it is. Jesus. Um, actually, it can. Uh, a hand and a half sword, because you have two hands coming down, would actually more chop than slice. But the weight of the blade allows it to chop. Now, this is a pretty thin one, making it relatively well-balanced. Bears no fuller, meaning that the full blade is reinforced on a thrust. So if you had an opponent in, like, leather or chain or something, you could easily run them through with this kind of blade and not worry a dime about your blade cracking or breaking or bending. Definitely a well-made blade for, like, an onion knight. Probably not for, like, an officially recognized knight. Now, for those of you who don't know, Onion Knights are knights that are sponsored. They're usually poor people who are recognized at, like, tournaments for their skill and are, are hired that way. Um, again, not a true knight's sword, but definitely a sword that'll get the job done. Moving on to a true knight's sword, the game calls it the long sword. This is a regular in-game weapon. This is not one of my weapon pack weapons. As you can see, the fuller gives way to a true diamond top which allows for great stabbing and definitely some weight at the end of the blade for the hacking and slicing, while the fuller runs along the earlier length of the blade to reduce the weight. Generous, real generous handle to allow you to have two-handed grip and light enough to be wielded with one hand. This is a knight's sword. This is a knight's weapon. Got, if I had my shield on, I'm, you know, I'm here, I'm blocking, stabbing, slicing, thrusting, grab it into the other hand, say my shield's knocked out, say I drop my shield, grab it into the other hand, you've got your blocks here, heavy chops, whoa, Jesus, you've got your blocks here, you've got your heavy chops coming in, good thrusts coming back, it is a nasty bit of work, but it is also a beautiful piece of art. All right, moving on to what I got on my bar A. Here we go. The muck, the mucker, muckeria, muckera. I don't know. The the Hakuna Matata. <laughs> this is a uh kind of like a copus, kind of like a falcata. Um, it's all bronze, solid bronze blade. Um, I forgot the Mycenaean blade over here, another classic bronze blade, as you can tell. Uh, well, copper as well, copper and bronze. As you can tell by the greening here by the handle, ordained gold up here. This is a straight taper blade. It doesn't round at all, allowing for excellent stabbing, but not as great slashing. Uh, the Mycenaean blade was used, obviously, by the Mycenaeans and, and early Greek soldiers before Greece really became its own powerhouse. This was more often used by Greek soldiers post-powerhouse. This blade had a decent tip there. As you can see, a real strong tip, solid bronze construction, but great chopping power to really get through any of the barbarian hordes uh, surrounding Greece, while also being light enough and thin enough that one could, 
wear this, their full armor kit, and not even have to slow down. Um, probably more or less given to the Pelatus and the Javelineers than the actual Hoplites. This kind of sword would have been a sidearm for a, a skirmisher. You know, somebody who throws, ouch, somebody who like throws javelins and is like, oh, I need to be a quick light soldier. I need a quick light weapon. Here you go. On my other hip, I know it's not medieval, but this is a cutlass. The cutlass was used by Spanish sailors and other people uh, who, who sailed. And the reason it was used by sailors was because it's short enough that they can wear it on their hip. It's light enough that it's not going to weigh them down if they have to swim. And it's, it's a chopping weapon meant to cut ropes, meant to cleave limbs, has a great handle per, or hand guard there so that you're not going to lose a limb or lose some fingers. This weapon was an infamous weapon used by pirates. And the reason I wanted to include it, even though it's not medieval, is because I've been playing a lot of Sea of Thieves lately, like a metric ton of Sea of Thieves. And I got some pirate fever going on, so fuck off if you got an issue with it. <laughs> now, this cutlass has a sharpened crescent tip back here, which I love because one of my favorite is coming through and then coming back with that back hook slice. And something like this, that's almost a falks curve right there. That's definitely going to slice a neck or a throat. Now we move on to the shoulders. We're going to go... Do I have nothing on this? I have nothing on that shoulder, do I? All right, on my other shoulder then. We have the flamyard, or flamard. Not quite a flamburs, but a lot of flam weapons, F-L-A-M, whatever the fuck. Um, those were because they had wavy blades like this. That flame blade, air quotes there, was meant to give a wider cut, or, or a wider cut on a stab, and a deeper cut on slices, because it act like serrets, but without being teeth. And again, I know I've talked about this. Here are some serrets. Thank you, Jake. Um, beautiful piece of, of, of work, nasty bit of work, especially because of this blade here. As you can see, the fuller runs the length except for the straightened tip. That way, again, your stabbing does not risk the stability of your blade. I'm going to go ahead and put that on that shoulder. And I'm going to treat you guys to a little treat because I got a free shoulder. So we're going to talk about something that was a knife, became a sword, and ended up a great sword. The Kriegsmacer. Now, Messers literally means knife. Uh, so these are falchions. Falchions were best against, and it says right here, unarmored opponents. Because as you can see, it, it's a, a long, thin blade. And I know I talked about these on uh, the chopping weapon one, I, at least I should have. These were meant for taking out peasantry, leather-armed, and unarmored opponents. Um, Messers, though, were the Onion Knight variant. So you have the Langs Messer, um, yep, resembling the construction of a knife. Its weighted blade gives it formidable cuts at the expense of thrusting power. Let's see, now, the Kriegs Messer was the war version, that's why it's so feckin' large. The, the Langsmesser literally just means long knife. Oh no, my mug. Uh, it means long knife. And as you can see, it ends very similar to my scimitar. And that's probably just a stylistic choice by the artist who made this weapon, uh, Sujin. Um, he tends to do that with, with a lot of things. He'll take his, his artistic liberties. But you know what? He makes beautiful weapons, so I'm not even going to get upset. Um, here is the Man-at-Arms Messer, and again, that same creative liberty there on the back. Now, this is called the Man-at-Arms because it has this guard here protecting you. Now, you'll note, both of them have a little hook going over the right. Why over the right, not the left? Because that is to protect the hand while also not costing a lot of, met uh, a lot of metal. Remember, these were the Onion Knight's chopper, meaning that they were not, you know, very well paid for. They were poor people who were sent to war at the expense of the king. The king paid for these guys to go murder people, and he wasn't going to outfit them like true knights, because true knights were generally nobility or retainers of nobility. 
Onion knights were just really talented swordsmen who rose up from the common people. All right, we're going to fight a few people here. Uh, moving on to that that portion of the show. I'm going to start with this bad boy and then we're going to we're going to move on bam 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 in the same order that I showed the weapons. So he comes in, you dodge. Bam! Right there with that needle tip. Right there with that needle's tip. Right in through the body. Uh, now I'm going to show off its chopping potential. Our next volunteer is right there. Ooh. Wielding the, the blade I have on my back. A two-cut kill. Thanks to its, its decent belly and weight, this thing was hitting him square in the head like a ton of bricks. So my hand's kind of covering, but the first hit hit him right here in the dome, but was stopped by the skull, because as you see by the blood, I only ever hit him with the tip. But even just hitting him with the tip, those two shots were enough to kill him. Imagine if I'd got him with that belly, you know, that, that decent belly of the sword. Oh, look at that deep cut. Oh, you can see where it took all the way down to the, the, the shoulder bone there. Deep, nasty cut. Yeah, see, look at that. Deep, nasty cuts off that belly of the blade. All right, moving on to the cutlass, the pirate's favorite. Now, I'm going to be wielding it. You know what? I'm going to wield it in my right just so that handguard actually doesn't look stupid. <laughs> Not normally a righty, so forgive me here. Really? No, you're still alive. There we go. Now you ain't. Now, I hit her right here, uh, right here, and it carried through that tip. The cutlass, major chopper, as you can tell, missing a head. Um, typically, pirates did not wear armor, because if you went overboard, you'd just fucking sink like a rock. So, fighting the gladiators here in the arena, very similar to what you'd be fighting on, say, a pirate ship. Um, with the exception that the, we're not getting uh, salt water in our wounds. All right, let's take a look here. So as you can see, deadly hit to the next what did it by the spurting blood. See, that wasn't even a hard hit to the neck, and that is that is a deep cut. This weapon was made for that slicing, and it does it really well. Definitely not a stabbing weapon. That's not to say you couldn't stab with one. Um, if I if I go back to the top here, um, not the Swiss saber. Where is it? No, there there was a uh, there was a type of saber that was wielded by uh, no uh, close, definitely, probably. Um, there was a type of Italian side sword. It was wielded by the Italian uh, Navy. All right, here's a good one, the Naval Cutlass. Um, again, because it's aligned pretty well, you could stab with it against an unarmored opponent. It'd go in easy enough, but not against somebody wearing, like, plate mail. But again, you're not going to fight a plate mail wearing opponent on a boat. So yeah, a Cutlass could stab. Even this one could probably pierce somebody. Just because that blade is sharp. Would I do it? Definitely. Definitely, definitely, definitely. Because a stab is a really good way to get a long part of your blade into the body. Would I recommend it? Definitely, definitely, definitely. Because, again, a stab, very deadly. Now, say I'm on land, and I'm fighting like a, a fort guard. You know, where we're besieging a fort to take the gold within. And they've got plate mail wearing guards firing cannons and muskets at us. Would I stab? No. No, 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 no. I would shoot him with my flintlock pistol in the face. All right, next, we're going to go to my left shoulder. The Fremyard, which uh, whoever died here was wielding. Now, first is going to come that stab. <laughs> 
Didn't even have to slow down time for that one. Ugh. That is that is pinning her arm to her the other side of her body. That is through her and her arm. Gross. So yeah, as you can see, sturdy tip goes in real smooth. Um, and then once you get to the wider serrets, it causes an even wider, deeper cut. Uh, now we're going to move on to the slicing. I'm going to wield it in two hands. Uh, uh, done. Done. That is a deep cut, square to the neck. And that was like right here. Right here at the end of the, uh, right where the reinforcement starts. Nasty bit. Now I'm going to try and get higher up the blade and use these waves. So we're going to do one more. Two hands here. He comes in. Bing. Come in. Shoom. Done. I put the sword against his neck. Pulled. Causing these, uh, these waves to act like serrets. This is what they look like again. Thank you, Jake. Um, and that caused a deep enough cut to just slice an artery he done. His foot also hit a spike over here, so that probably wasn't too pleasant. Um, he's using the Mycenaean blade, which I was talking about earlier. This is what it looks like in a bit more detail. Hi, Bonnie. Shut up, please. I love you. She's going to hear me say that to her a lot throughout her life. Shut up, I love you. All right, now we're moving on to the Messer. And again, I'm going to wield it in my right, just so it doesn't look stupid. Um, again, not a stabbing weapon. Definitely a chopping weapon. As you can see. Bah! Nope. Bah! There we go. Yep, definitely a chopping weapon. We're going to do one more. The length of this blade is nice. It has a very shallow fuller in it because this was not made by, the, by you know, probably the most capable blacksmith. These, these since they were essentially just knives, you didn't need to be uh, a court blacksmith to make one of these things. You just had to be a blacksmith because anybody could make a knife. Now, that's the thing. Not anybody could make swords. Only certain blacksmiths were allowed to make swords. Anybody could make a knife. So they made big feckin' knives. And sold them as swords. Alright, that does it for today's episode. He was wheeling the Basslard, which I... Oh no, this isn't. This is the Cusped Falcon. So, I don't know if you guys saw that. I have a battery low. Uh, I believe it. The, the Cusped Falcon... Or not Cusped Falcon. The Basslard Falcon here. Um, definitely a nice chopping sword with a, with a decent handle. Yep, the Basslard Hilt Falchion. Um, there's a Basslard Dagger, which is like this, but it's a straight point. This is like Falchion, a slicing weapon that you shouldn't really stab with, but that's a decent point against an unarmored opponent. Oh, I'm going for that stab. Bam. But this definitely has more chopping potential than the dagger did. Probably something I should look into, because I really like the dagger. I should look into that one. All right, I'm going to end this one here, guys. Have a beautiful day. Class dismissed.